Well, let's look at the Great Pyramid. I got a, a question in a, a recent comment section asking about the Houdan ramp theory, but I think that goes further and we'll also be bringing in well volume versus height and also the building rate. So you've probably heard, well, it, a block has to be laid every two to three minutes over the 20 year period and so forth. Okay, now, so there's a, the pyramid now, 230 meters at the base. I'm just rounding off to the nearest meters, 147 meters high. So we get uh, 2,592,100 cubic meters. Now, because it's a pyramid, it's much bigger at the bottom than at the top. So the top half of the pyramid, that's 324,000 cubic metres. The top half of the pyramid is only 12.5% of the total. So the bottom half of the pyramid is 87.5% complete. Now, I think, now think of the top three quarters of the pyramid. Now that's uh, 1 million... 93,500 cubic metres. That's 42.2% of the total, meaning that when you're only one quarter of a way up, you're 57.8% complete. Well, you're actually higher than it, and I'll show you why now. However, so there's a Google Earth view. Now, at the northeast corner, what you can see is... I didn't show... Okay, now, maybe you have to follow the... Now, especially here you can see that it's still bedrock. That's not blocks that have been added. They've left bedrock there, which is uh, not only would strengthen and pin the structure together, but it's also a great way of cheating to reduce the amount of stone being used. Now that would otherwise have been covered up by the casing stones, but that's not all because here's uh, Piazzi Smythe. Now you see the entrance, so the basal line or the, the baseline, ground level, well, the entrance passage and the descending passage hits bedrock before that point, as well does the, um, uh, the well shaft. So the grotto is in natural rock. Now, Piazzi Smythes points out the outline of a rock uh, in, is, in the otherwise solid masonry is inferred only. So this red section, we don't know the exact shape of how much bedrock is there underneath. We do know at the well and the grotto, we hit bedrock and at the beginning of a descending passage. And we also have that block on the northeast corner. So we don't know exactly how much bedrock is in there, but just as, you know, I extend those blue lines out. So there we see that's where the bedrock is if you stripped away. And, and you now, of course, we don't know how far and, and where it begins, but just to give an idea, <coughs> it's not just stones on flat. It wasn't leveled flat and then built on top. There was a mound, a, a, a mountain, a peak there as well. We don't know exactly height. So there we have the bedrock visible on the corner and we can also, from the passages, get an idea of when that comes in. So there the yellow marks where it begins. Now, how much bedrock was used? Now, it could be that much, could be that much, or it could be less. We don't know. However, it's still this is an important point because any bedrock, even just a thin layer of bedrock across the base has a massive impact on the, on the volume required to build it because the pyramids narrow down. So the area is very big at the bottom and it's very, very small for each level at the top. Now, <coughs> but, um, for instance, the, the bent pyramid, we still see the casing stones. They had a smooth outer casing and then it went straight to rough stones. Uh, the Great Pyramid is a bit different because we have a smooth outer casing and then we have an inner casing which is well fit but still not precision fit. Big gaps and, and a lot of lime mortar to, to fill in the corners. So underneath the casing, so for in this, this area here, you start to see what's behind the pyramids including tiny little pebbles uh, and, and of course a lot of mortar. So we zoom in a little bit further. And so what's at the lower levels there, we already we can see much, much smaller stones. Uh, the average is about, they say about 1.5 tonnes. The heaviest blocks at the base on the outside are about 15 tonnes. In the King's Chamber and the Grand Gallery, there are some blocks up to, up to 80 tonnes. But you can't really take this average 
so first, if you average it out, those higher blocks are going to lift up the average, and the average is is based on how big they are on visible on the outside. Now, of course, once you start counting these little stones in here, the average is going to drop off really, really quickly. So here are some other pictures. Now, some will say, "Oh, but this is uh, modern repairs." Well, no, the pyramid is built from mainly rough cut stone and rubble and mortar. You can see a lot of this mortar at the bottom. This is not a uh, a repair because they would have had to strip the entire they would have had to dismantle the pyramid to repair it so no it, it is not a repair and also some of the um because of the, the gypsum mortar that is in there i'm sorry i'll keep calling it light the little gypsum mortar has organic material in there and that's used to date it so we know at least uh that it goes back to to this mor uh, mortar is very 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 old I'll try to link these in the description because I did a video which uh, Stonemason looks at the Stonemasonry Ancient Egyptian Pyramids. It's a compilation of Mike Haddock because he goes not only to the Great Pyramid, he goes to the um, Bent Pyramid, Red Pyramid and Caffrey's Pyramid and shows quite, again it's not with special permission just by walking out the outside, but underneath the casing that the stone is very, very rough. Uh, as a mason they use the term junk or rubble. It's rough, not even rough cut stone, it's roughly hewn stone. I'll also try to remember to link analysing the Egyptian pyramids in the digital age because that's an important one too. But for instance there you can see circled in yellow the northeast corner. This is an older card. But we get to see what the pyramid looks like underneath the casing stones. Now here's from the analysing the pyramids in the digital age. Again, you know, you see that in much higher resolution. What you see there is how the pyramids, what they were built of. So people see the case, that's, you know, beauty is skin deep. Those casing stones are just a skin, a thin little skin. And again, in terms of volume, that's minuscule compared to the pyramid as a whole. So that's what the pyramids are built out of. Uh, you know, over 95% of the volume of the pyramids is built with rough hue. These are not even cut blocks. You can see that they're split. They're not cut. They're not, you know, even there's... The tool marks are minimal. They're just, their rubble is what they are. So you don't have to cut them and make smooth sides. The pyramid is not precision built, perfectly laid stones. This is just untrue. And again, it's been said by people who have visited many times as well. Now, uh, they did digital scans. They go inside, they show photography. Please watch the whole thing. Um, so that's what the pyramid is like on the inside. That level of stonework is much, you know, it's it's not good. You know, now they go, oh, but the stone, look at, you, look at this stone over here. It's some, um, you know, uh, that, that's how they, that's cottage, you know, country cottage level of of stone masonry. That's what's making up the pyramid. That's uncomfortable, but that's how they did it. Uh, when, when you make a grand piano, uh, you, you don't varnish the underside. You know, when you make furniture, you know, you don't varnish the underside of a cabinet. You do the outside and the trim, and you, you can, uh, so not precise, uh, perfectly laid block. That might be true. We don't really have the casing stones of Great Pyramid. We can see in the Bent Pyramid that it was very well made. But again, uh, even the Bent Pyramid, full of mortar and one layer of smooth casing skin and the massive volume underneath is, is made by this type of stone. Now, that stone there is very, very stable. As long as you have multiple contact points, you don't need to have each side touching. You just need one corner, the middle and the corner touching. And in some cases, now I should have included that other, but well, you can again, please watch analyzing digital period. Uh, begins around the 35 to 40 minute mark where you can see him go um, in there. And I'll put that link in the description. And so what they've also, now if I, so this is, based now to see the inside this is what the pyramids were built like they were not precision or you know perfectly laid we have a smooth casing on the outside a double casing in terms of uh of the great pyramid um we have rough hewn blocks which form these sectors which stabilize it and then we have rubble and mortar just you know in there to fill in the gaps because you don't need to fill it all up to have that structure done and again, now that's where you can see the internals, but even from the outside, even just on Google Street View, you can just go along and you'll see really uh, rough 
hewn, not cut, just sort of split, just the, the rubble going off. All right. Uh, now that sort of brings back because I, I personally felt like I've at least maybe an internal ramp or a sort of semi-internal external ramp. I don't really know. I think that that Houdan, uh, you know, f f f years. I, I think that this is there is cool evidence for that. Um, would need further investigation. I think that yeah, uh, could be done. Uh, but this also might lay to tracings of like a sort of semi-exposed external ramp uh, as being another way to go. Uh, there are a few. I'll even link a uh, great video. Jeez, I should, should have in included the card. I think the video is called How I Would Have Built the Pyramids. And it's this, it's this guy just you know, talking about how you would organise the teams and, and allow entry for other people to come in. I think he also is a beautiful explanation of why the pyramids are eight-sided. There might be further depth to that, but even in terms of construction, I'll try to remember to link that in the description. I think it's called How I Would Have Built the Pyramids, talking about the logistics and team placement uh, to allow multiple teams to work at the same time. Now, that's a very important point. Now, uh, from the top, again, you can see these are not precision, perfectly laid stones. Again, this is the quality of stonework which makes up the pyramids. Not poo-pooing it because... When you see another, when you see other buildings, uh, you know, with a beautiful casing on it, and then rough hewn other stones beyond, that's just the way that people have been building throughout history. Now you see it through us, Egypt. They'll show you uh, nice granite or basalt casing stones, but then you can, you know, if you've got an eye for it, then you'll see that behind that that it's infilled with rubble or junk. These are terms that are uh, sort of used. So just, it, it's not an opinion. You can just by observing the photos. Again, this is a curiosity with the uh, Lost High Tech teams. You'll see, well, pick this, I'll look at this perfect spot, but they don't show you the hundred or, or thousand other rough hewn stones. I'll say, well, how many blocks? Well, what are the blocks made of? What are their sizes? Now, that's another point. So, like these blocks up here, uh, you know, these are not large, large stones. Now, they are large if you're going to handle them by yourself, but again, they're just. You can see, you know, people uh, in their backyards who have to move a, a big block and what they do with uh, flop winches or uh, lever winches or these other sort of to bring them up there. So again, these weights, very small, you know, with a simple lever winch, uh, one person could easily move and manipulate uh, these size of blocks. Now, it depends on uh, they have shadoof. Did they maybe have, well, it's just... Cranes are just a variation on rig on sail rigging. They knew how to sail. They knew how to make cranes. Uh, and just like in the old days, people didn't buy purpose-built cranes. You would grab a few logs, uh, maybe carry. Uh, you know, you could either make or, or for ease carry a, a a compound pulley. Use your rope and lift these things up. The, again, these are, speak to anyone who's in lifting or construction or even just an enthusiast. There are countless videos on YouTube, again, about people on their own moving equivalent stones as well. So when it comes to the, like, 15-ton stones down on the bottom level or the 80-ton stones in the King's Chamber and Grand Gallery, there you're going to need a little bit more skill. But uh, historically, you know, black and white film and photo, again, you can see people moving those types of stones uh, uh, Cleopatra's obelisks, uh, Paris obelisks. Historically, people like this is nothing. Sorry, it's even even uh, it, moving two hundred tons. Not only theoretically capable, but historically, really no big deal. So two point three million blocks. Firstly, uh, how do we know? Well, I you know I think it. It could be much less depending, but probably much, much more, I would think, given that the internal stones are, include uh, palm-sized, you know, like a person, you know, a child could carry some of those stones used in to fill in the gaps. But the argument is, well, it can't have been done in 20 to 30 year period because that would be a one block based on 20 years, one block every two to three minutes with a 2.3 million block count. Well... Yeah, that makes sense if only one team was working on the pyramid at the whole. So if you say you need one every two to three minutes, well, again, that 
that's maybe you know, mathematically correct, but uh, in the real world, that's what you're really suggesting. It, it, there was only one team working at what at to do. It. Now, of course, that's not true. We know that the pyramids had organized large work crews, very well organized. Many hands make light work. So the base of a pyramid is 230 meters. So you could have 23 teams building the casing stone. So they're working on a length uh, of 33 feet or 10 meters each, which would mean that there's room in between for other teams to access the interior because you're not just building the casing stones, you've got to fill in the inside. And you build the casing stones and then you fill in the inside. Again, uh, the Mike Haddock videos, he shows even the satellite pyramids. That's how it was done. That's how it's still being done. Um, now, there, there could be, now, what other techniques did they use to help along the way? Well, we don't have a record, I can't say. But the internal, so the base length, but we have the internal area. So you have 23 teams, 10 metres each, and then we'll take a team off from each side. And there, each team would have a 10 by 10 metre area to, that they need to work in, which would mean that you would have avenues, room for teams to get from the inside to the outside. There'd, there'd be plenty of room for each team to be working. And again, they're not placing 15 ton giant stones. As we can, once you get inside, we're talking rough hewn, uh, well, some squared off blocks, but not this precision, perfect, laid no that's that's reserved to the outside and to the internal chambers and passages and stuff this applies and can be clearly seen through all the other pyramids as well this is not uh opinion they can you know people like mike haddock and others who have shown it but digital uh analyzing the well anyone who's like actually like looking at it pointing at it and, okay well that's mortar and it's rough hewn blocks or when the blocks are squared off they're laid uh, no better or a lot worse than, than what is, you know, later times. Is, uh, now, certainly if you go to well, the Roman temples, Greek temples, Persian temples, Indian temples, and you'll see that they're laid up. So it's rough stuff on the inside. So 21 by 21, we can have 441 teams working on the inside, 92 teams on the outside, with each having a 10 metre length or a 10 by or a hundred meter 10 by 10 meter area that they're working on leaving room to move so that's 533 teams you could have uh working um now say 10 people per team well five thousand people no problem you know what the, the pharaoh organizes friggin' armies to go out there and so now I've got a follow-up coming in regards to working limestone, copper tools, and, and these others, and how long does it take to actually cut blocks and stuff like that. But uh, that'll be the second. There's your quarrying teams. And again, they're not quarrying blocks mostly. They're quarrying rough-hewn stone, splitting it. All right, so one block every three minutes, if that's one team's working. Well, if you have 533 teams, each team would need to lay a block each 1,599 minutes. We're at 1,440 minutes in 24 hours. So 10 hour working day, 600 minutes. Uh, each team would need to lay a block every two and a half days. If you have multiple teams working with enough area to move. If one team built it, uh, you need to lay a block every 2.5 minutes. So, hmm, it's, you know, like if you present it in one way and mathematically correct every two to three minutes, but shouldn't they just sort of add, and I bought into this because back in the day, like when, you know, I started getting into Graham Hancock and then I heard all this, well, you can't lift that and the rope would snap and the wood would crush and uh, so when I, you know, started fact-checking down a little bit and then, well, okay, not a fan anymore, not a fan anymore, you know. Uh, or, yeah, anyway, but uh, so in r real world where you have multiple teams working with plenty of room to move, where you're not depicting these precisions, like each block you cannot fit a credit card or a needle, or you no, know, it's just that's not the reality of it. There are blocks fit like that. But then I could go to any stone masonry site, uh, historical buildings here in Sydney, Paris, London, New York, anywhere in the world, you name it, and you will find the same method. Uh, nice granite casing stones, 
and rough hewn on the inside or just go go to a country church a medieval church look at the ones made out of limestone look how they fit their stones together uh, a lot better than what makes up 95 percent or more of a pyramid those rough hewn um, you know stones you can crawl between some gaps you can ram your whole arm between some gaps you could put a credit card machine through the gaps and that that is what defines it. It's the, the overwhelming majority of rough-hewn stone defines a pyramid, not the skin of the casing stones and not the very small percentage which makes up the internal, such as the Grand Gallery, King's Chamber, etc. Now, even on the other internals, sometimes you see really nice work and there's also quite a bit of very rough work um, in there as well. So the pyramids is a stone every two to three minutes. Yeah, if one team's working, but in reality, no. What we, what you need is a stone every two and a half days. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. Can you quarry stones with copper tools in that time? Not a problem. Uh, I'll show that in some follow-ups. But Pyramid Builders New Clues, for instance, was one where they show how um, in regards to moving blocks. But So, yeah, it's uh, this two to three minute thing. Well, mathematically correct, but in not not genuinely correct because well, um, and the stones are, are rough, sometimes very very rough. There's a lot of r rubble and mortar fill. Uh, now, if you include, for instance, those cavities that they've found uh, recently with the muon detection, again that, that's now reducing the volume that you need to work even more. Uh, and again, of course, this that's that's how the, that's what the pyramids were made of. That's what you see. That's what they were made of. So when you talk about how many blocks per minute, how much to cut, well, actually you've got split blocks, not cut blocks. That's that's the pyramid, and that also applies to red bed Caffrey's pyramid and others as well. You can see it from the outside, and where those places where you can get inside, it is there. So. I'll try to put those links in the description. Gypsum mortar, uh, a lot of you know, normal masonry that you would see anywhere else in the world is a defining, is the overall define, overwhelming defining feature of it. Uh, we have those outer casing stones. I did some videos way back in regards to them, and because the north ones are really good condition, but the, the east, west, and south of really the the, the the outer casing is severely deteriorated. So. I, uh, but also when it comes to construction, just the, the volume, you know, because the pyramid's big at the bottom and it narrows down. So that's like, a, the, you, once you get the pyramid to less than one quarter height, at one quarter, you're over 57.8% complete. Now I mention that because the depends how much bedrock is actually built making that up because at one quarter, if the more bedrock you add, that number of percentage really goes up. So if you had quite a bit more bedrock, uh, you'd have, well, the pyramid would be uh, 75%, 70%, uh, maybe, the, the, I don't know the exact figure because we don't know exactly how much bedrock, where it is spread and how thick it is. But at the even if there was no bedrock at all, first quarter, you're three-fifths complete uh, with the bedrock in there you're really pushing up that level and so you have multi, you have a lot of teams low and as you get higher of course you're going to have less room but you need therefore less teams and you get higher and higher and higher so it's not uh, ridiculous it's you know um, I, I don't know was it 20 I, I tend to think I, my personal belief is that uh, there was maybe something, you know, they, there was already something there and then they expanded on, on top of it or there was already like a sake, you know, for instance, the grotto, uh, but this, these were already sacred places. Caffrey Pyramid and the Great Pyramid are built on uh, bedrock plugs. There was already something there. It wasn't just a flat, let's make a flat surface and s stack up stones after that. There was already definitely something there. We know that because there's bedrock still there and we, we know because of the internal chambers uh, the descending passage and the, the well shaft hitting bedrock earlier. Uh, a, a small amount of bedrock at, spread across the base is going to have a massive amount of volume in comparison to the pyramid above. Yeah, so it's... 
hmm, yeah, it's worth you know, uh, worth thinking about, worth including, because again, this is not um, included. You know, but, uh, when you watch the and listen and read the Lost High Tech stuff, get the impression that all the stones are perfectly fit. No, that's only the skin on the outside. There is a lot of bedrock there, and so if you think about volume versus height, now how did they get the stones up higher? Uh, well, it narrows down, and so you need less. And also the stones are smaller. The higher you get, the smaller the stones um, tend to be. But even on the lower levels, the stones are, are not huge. The average 1.5 ton, well, the average gets lifted by the by the heavier stones. Now, if you, well, you look at it, and also the number, that depends on the number of stones being 2.3 million. Well, we don't know that, and given you know, they've got so many little rocks jammed in and limestone mortar, that that number is is really not going to be anywhere close to, uh, well, it depends on what you, how you define, but that number is not true. Uh, you know, it's a good approximate just to explain things, but the number's not, it's not correct. Uh, yeah, and so pyramids and volume, if you think, you know, if you sort of think, again, it's always presented you know, every two, three minutes, the stones weigh this huge amount. They're precisely cut and precisely fit. Uh, no, no, none of none of these things are actually uh, correct. Now, there's a lot of questions, and we, like we don't have a time machine, we don't have the receipts of exactly how they did it. So I don't know. No one can really say that they did. That's true. Um, but those who sort of would use that for the lost high tech um, uh, argument, that sort of works in in their direction as. Um, as well, but what we do have is you know tools and techniques and stuff that did exist. They do work. Again, we'll do a compilation of uh, limestone and granite uh, work with uh, copper and stone pounders. But you know, bedrock, big change in the amount of volume of how much was to be done. So they got to a quarter. If they had a bit more bedrock, if the bedrock was, uh, for instance, let's say, shaped something like that, uh, before they'd even begun they would be somewhere between 10 to 20 percent maybe more already finished before they, even the first stone was put down a lot of rubble a lot of mortar to fill those things up again not an opinion we can see what well, clearly see that unfortunately it's not really shown it's presented in a certain way and yeah just to repeat these types of stones is what defines the pyramids not just the bent, not just the red, not just calf rays, not just the satellite pyramids, but the, the great pyramid as well. And uh, also like the way they lean in, which just bog standard construction techniques that masons have been using as well. Uh, that's not lost high technology and it certainly isn't geopolymer as well. Not form worked, for instance. And yeah, alrighty. So that's, yeah, this is what's actually, this is what, is actually happening and then we've got like yeah, internal ramp i think that's you know there is cool evidence uh you know for there uh even again because the majority of a pyramid in terms of volume is on the lowest one quarter so you wouldn't have a ramps necessary even sort of just side ramps coming in um using a hoist using the actual casing stones as a ramp the pyramid is as a slope that gives you that's a ramp mechanical advantage comes into it so you could yeah the ramp is the pyramid in those cases as well and again yeah not the greatest it's the size the logistics impressive uh, some of the stonework is beautiful but again not exempt and not impossible and we see again uh masons you know pre uh modern machinery would we're filling granite and all this other stuff without diamond technology and that sort of stuff as well. And yeah, that's it. How much do you think you could lay a block if you had a team? And especially, you know, you've been working for a few months, so you got experience. Do you think you could lay a block every two and a half minutes? Right, I don't see no problem with that at all. Uh, sorry, two and a half minutes, two and a half days. Not a problem. I just, yeah, not, not, I, now I'm going to say big deal. It's no big deal, as Mike Haddock would say. And so, yeah, this... Unfortunately, yeah, so there you go. Uh, it is this 
myth um, presented, you know, it's presented that two to three minutes mathematically correct, not really correct, that they're all precision laid and perfect and, and flat surfaces and all, and you can't fit a credit card. Absolute rubbish. That's not true. Uh, you can, again, you can see that. These are the people who go on tours and like, they, I've seen them say it as they walk past the fucking stones. <laughs> like what? What, are, what is? Yeah. Um, anyway, mortar, rubble, and there you go. So any f theories must be based on what the pyramid is actually built from and how those stones are laid, and that just really makes uh, the you know the Atlantean or lost high technology or alien or even I've got to say geopolymer. Uh, it doesn't really stand up because the internals is what defines the pyramids the casing stones are just the skin have a good one